Thank you so much for being here this evening. What a pleasure to see your films on this big screen. Um, let's start from that. No, actually, we'll start with you, Michelle. If you can, we'll, we'll share mics. And um, if you could say what film you're from, and I think we'll just run through and do an introduction for everyone, and then we'll get into qu questions. Your name and film and what you did. Sure. My name is Michelle Stolicki, and, uh, and I'm the producer of Memories of the Sea. My name is Thais Rosinor, and I'm the director of Memories of the Sea. Hello, I'm Bahia, and I'm a street artist from Cairo. Uh, my name is Mark Nicholas. I'm the director and producer of Nefertiti's Daughters. Bravo. Hi, I'm Susan Bro, and I'm producer of Tea with the Dead. So we had a really eclectic program, and we have representatives from animation, documentary, and fiction um, on the stage. Uh, Thais, I'd like to start with you. Um, could you tell us where the idea for your story came from? Did it start with a character, a place? What? Sure. Um, so this is a script that a friend of mine, Suresh and Suresh, wrote originally, and it's a part of a... Um, our master's program at Columbia where uh, we have this project where somebody writes a script and then you as a director approach that writer uh, if you're interested in the story and you pitch um, the way that you envision directing it and then you work together to adapt the script into something that um, that you wanna that you wanna come um, place in the screen so um, so this is a uh, story that originally came from him but I identified with the themes uh, that he, I identified with the themes that he was touching so um, I approached him and and um, and then we started working together and restructuring it yeah um, could you say a little bit about if it's not too personal what themes you identified why did it this project particularly speak to you um, I think it's uh, it's very interesting to see how kids uh, understand the world around them and how they adapt to new situations and um, they deal with grief and loss and something that I've dealt with personally and um, and how when adults don't give you answers you have to find answers and create your own uh, explanation of what's going on and. That's something that I felt very drawn to and, and wanted to explore and take to the screen, yeah. And Michelle, how did you come to work with Thais? It's part of the same collaboration. We, I'm, I'm in the MFA program as a creative producer, and uh, part of the process is also to find a director and a writer and be able to produce a story. And we had a wonderful idea of bringing it to Brazil, so we decided to go all together and find the location and figure out how we can do it. And uh, it was just a wonderful collaboration to have together with this great group of people from Columbia University. And was the script set in Brazil? Or did you, if, if it wasn't, why did you choose Brazil as your place to go? Other than, like, what a great place to go. Well, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, Thais, she lived there when she was younger. I'm from there. And we felt together that uh, it would be great to shoot it down there. So we took the challenge. So Mark, I'm gonna start with you um, for, tell us how this was a long process, this distillation of wanting to, it, just talk about the evolution of this project and how you came to specifically focus on what you focused on and how you found your wonderful artists. Uh, before I became a filmmaker, I had spent about 15 years in, in national democratic politics. And my political career began through the press and communications shop. So I'd always had a um, fascination by the ability to communicate message to the public. And so when I was looking at doing a, a short last year, actually this was only, I mean, I interviewed Bahia less than a year ago. Um, I, I was, this was at the time, uh, the Arab uh, uprisings had, had happened and I had been sort of mesmerized by all the, the street art and uh, revolutionary graffiti 
that came out of these uprisings. And especially in countries with authoritarian regimes that don't have a free press, that, that this, this language becomes a primary device to communicate to the masses, particularly illiterate masses who have to now you know, rely largely on, on images. So the thought was to do a, a you know, 20, 25 minutes short on you know, generally on revolutionary street art. And like most film projects, if you go down this road, the general becomes the specific. And as I was doing my research, I stumble upon this remarkable six minute TED talk by this Egyptian woman artist who was sitting next to me, who did a TED talk, who did a TED talk about her, her no project. And it was just, I was floored by it. And I remember looking at that and, and telling my girlfriend like, this is the story. It's not just about the revolution or the art. It's it's you know it's about the women and 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 unlike the the world of street art generally that is male dominated, what you find in a place like Egypt was that you know the top artists were as many women as there were men, and so that was sort of where I started to go down the road and started to reach out to some of these women because I thought that the real story here was the issues that the women face on the streets of Cairo, but also these unbelievable artists who run the risk of being assaulted as they're doing their art, and then after the assault, get arrested by their government for expressing a point of view. And so that was when it started, and uh, I, I spent 11 days in Cairo shooting last April, and amazingly, she decided to, uh, to she amazingly believed that a white male American filmmaker could possibly tell the story of, you know, Egyptian women artists. And I mean, that's just a humbling thing. And I can't believe she did it. And so. <laughs> Bahia, from your point of view as being a subject in a film and telling your story in a situation that continues, to be a very challenging one. I just am wondering if you could talk a little bit about your decision to participate in the film, um, where you are now with your art, it, it, where are the other street artists and the women? It, it would be wonderful to hear. Um, last July, a 17-year-old uh, graffiti artist was found uh, dead in the Nile. So the regime's message was very clear. We're not welcome on the streets anymore. Uh, many of the artists are now working abroad in New York and in Europe. Of, um, but some of us were still in Cairo, but we are not working on the street. So this is where we are now. We, we're trying to keep the message going in different venues, and the film is, is one of the ways for us to keep the story going, to, because people forget very quickly. Have the, you talk about the city being gray, and there's there's reference to the walls. Has has the government effaced all the graffiti? It's white now. It's all white. It's all white. It's all white. So, as artists and as revolutionaries, how else are you? What else are you doing? Is there another way that you're? getting your work out if, since it's dangerous to be in the streets. I'm just curious in terms of social media or... No, I, now I teach design. I have, I'm graduated. I developed a design program for the American University in Cairo. And I'm graduating my first class this year. So I've put all of my energy into my students. And I'm really proud of their ideas. Their, all of their projects are about identity and history and the revolution. So you channel the message until you can go back to the street, if we can ever go back to the street. Susan, you are the producer of Tea with the Dead. And what a beautiful combination of this very vivid, the, the 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 graphic the color the the creation of the characters and that, that melding with this wonderful audio can you tell us about the genesis of this project 
Yeah, well, I suppose um, Irish people are great storytellers and they're known for talking a lot. And I suppose every Irish person has a story to tell. So we just wanted to find everyday people with a good story. And that episode, Patricia, is actually the director's mother. And that is a true story. And we interviewed her for about four hours and we cried for the whole thing and we had to cut it down to seven minutes. And we have five more, four more of those stories and they're all amazing. So this is the director's mother and it's her story. And it's also a very poignant story because it's not only a story of adoption, but it also is a story of how women had babies and it, yeah, and can Ireland, you talk a little bit about well, that? Well, basically, Ireland is a, a very Catholic country, so I suppose up until quite recently, you know, children that were born out of wedlock, it was a big taboo, and it was an embarrassment to families. So, so many people have gone through this. So, I suppose it resonates with a lot of people, um, because there's so many stories now of women being forced to give babies up, and her mother, you know, was forced. She was a nurse. She went back after she had the baby and there was rumors in the town. She wasn't allowed to get her job back as a nurse. You know, she had to leave, go to Canada. She never married, she never had kids. And she carried this stigma with her her whole life. And even when her daughter came to Canada to meet her for the first time, she didn't tell anyone it was her daughter. Even though, you know, it was the happiest time of her life to finally meet her daughter, she still had that, that guilt of having a baby out of wedlock. So, you know, all the stories are, but, the, the idea of having the embalmer was was just a vehicle of, of their last story to tell to make it a bit more poignant, I suppose. And could you talk about where the framing device of the mortician having tea with a cadaver, a spirit, how did that come? Because there's so many ways to tell that story. I'm just yeah. curious, why was it told that way? Well, Irish people, as well as like to tell stories, they like their tea. So we do a lot of talking over tea. <laughs> so I suppose it was just, again, it was their last conversation over a cup of tea. And that, that was the, the premise. Thank you. Um, I would love to open it up to you in the theater, because I know you have questions. Please. Yeah, I'd, what, just a second, going back over here. Please. Yes. Can you speak up? Uh, the question is if there's, uh, for the filmmakers of, the, of Nefertiti's Daughters, if there's any fear of that there could be retaliation against the artists who appear in the film or towards you yourselves. Um, we've been trying to um, make a lot of public appearances everywhere. Um, I give talks to schools, to wherever I'm invited I go. And this is our strategy by keeping a very high profile. It's a kind of protection for us against the government. Um, but that doesn't mean that accidents can't happen. But, you know, it's part of the game. And what about for the other artists that appear in the film? I think they have the same concern. Some actually, Janzir is in um, New York because he was uh, he was being aggressively uh, pursued, so he just left the country. So, and it depends on how much um, spotlight they put on you. They just they can just decide to pick on you, and so. And this is maybe uh, this is. A maybe a difficult, probably a difficult question to answer, it's a difficult question to ask, in terms of uh, targets. It's it, that artists are truly seen as, uh, it, are, are artists considered sort of an easy prey for the government, or not, not as protected as a, Political figure who has a political party behind them, supporting them. So yes, in that sense, we are quite vulnerable. But uh, I think if you're not um, openly criticizing the current current regime, which which none of us has been doing, or actually a couple have been, and that's why they're out of the country. So if you don't openly criticize the current regime, then then you're fine. But the minute you start criticizing them, we have many activists in prison with very long prison sentences. 
Yes, there was a question that I, yes, please. Thoughts on Julian Assange? Yeah, who are you, I miss, would, do you have someone you're directing it to, please? No, no, we know, but, but to what filmmaker are you, is this to Mark? I mean, I don't have a strong, I mean, Julian Assange, I mean, I think Edward Snowden's an easier analysis. I mean, I, I view what he did as being something that was patriotic. He, he did his best to speak out against excesses, and I think he's been consistent. I mean, Julian Assange, for me, d does, I, I mean, there, there, there's a lot to like, and there's a lot to be, you know, like there was a, there was a dumping of information sort of out there without context that doesn't fully sit well with me. But, I, but what does sit well with me is the idea of greater transparency, holding our government accountable. And I think along those lines, I just don't think he's a clear-cut case like, a, like an Edward Snowden is for me, in, in my opinion. Um, I'm going to ask you a non-Julian Assange follow-up question. Um, at, you're talking about how you came to the film and how you revolutionary art in the streets. I'm just, could you share with us what it was like for you as a filmmaker to be interviewing these artists and how that informed your process, not only telling their story, but just you as a, 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 as a creative person? Well, I mean, you spend 11 days in Cairo interviewing people like Bahia and other artists who've been out there going after their government. And, and the first feeling I had as an American was I'd never really done a courageous thing in my life. I mean, any notion that I've ever been brave is a joke. I mean, you're, you're in a place like Cairo and you listen to what they've done and you just, you know, you quickly realize how we live in very, very different worlds. And I think there's that sense of just sheer awe that they do what they do and, and are prepared to suffer the consequences for it. I mean, as far as how it informed me as a filmmaker, it gave, you know, I grew up in Oakland, California, so I think anybody who's grown up in a rural urban area um, was raised with street art and graffiti around them, and you either, you know, for better or worse, saw it, and I'd always had an unexplored fascination with it, and didn't always know what to make of it, and then you go to a place like Egypt, and you realize that that street art and that graffiti in that climate becomes a prime way of communicating with the masses and pushing back on violence against women or you know rallying against the government and, and i think you really get a diff different appreciation for you know what street art can be or could be or should be um and i think that was what really made this film for me uh so such an amazing story it's not just the characters who are remarkable but the, the language that they use. Um, you know, you see artists, activists going back forever in conflict. And I think that, I mean, I think Bahia is an amazing example of that artist, at, you know, activist that, um, you know, just through sort of the simple act of paint on a wall, you can communicate your society's hopes and dreams and fears and demands in a way that people understand so quickly. Teresa, I'd like to ask you a question. Um, one of the things that is so I th affecting about Memories of the Sea is the point of view that you have and how you really enter the child's world. And, it start, and, and that how you withhold information from the audience in terms of point of view. And I just like to, we've talked a lot about uh, the last couple days about there's the, there's the script, there's the film you shoot, and there's the film you edit. Were there any, what were some of the dramatic changes that happened for you in terms of how that story is revealed? For um, sure, yeah, that, that was one of the main parts of restructuring the script. I wanted to, to have that slow reveal of information, and I wanted um, the audience to feel the same way that Fidel did, and not know exactly what was going on around him, and then, I took that into how I envisioned the movie and um, the shots helped me tell that by not showing the complete 
uh, world around him as well, and just seeing the grown-ups as parts, body parts, and and um, and just uh, um, having a um, having the 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 view of 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 the situation to, to say it in some way, uh, the same way that Fidel was doing it, and and that. Um, and that carry out carry out to to the edit um, uh, just by by having that slow reveal of the story, but but that was already uh, planned as I went on to shoot. That was the idea. Um, yeah, well, it's interesting that you say that about how you were you don't really show his whole world until he goes out at the end of the K, and then he's standing there and. and his his world opens up. Um, could you tell us a little bit about casting Fidel? He is really wonderfully photogenic. Yeah, he is amazing. Uh, it was wonderful to work with him. Uh, we work with a great casting director in Rio, uh, Carla Schuecki. Uh, she she found the the kid, and when I saw a picture of him, um, uh, I told Michelle like this. This is our kid. This is Fidel, and uh, I mean, we call for auditions because we we're like, okay, we have to see other kids. But we knew since we saw his first picture, and it was wonderful to work with him um, because he was. This is his first film, uh, uh, but at the same time, he was so talented and so enthusiastic, and he was very eager to to shoot. And then he. After each take, he wanted to see how he looked on the screen. He wanted to do the clapping, so he called action. Uh, um, so it was just so joyful to, to work around him, and his energy was great. Um, so I'm very excited for what he has ahead of him. He's very talented, yeah. Susan, you were saying that this film, the, the tea, tea with the Dead, is one of five. Can you tell us about the other four? Yeah. Um, and are they? And I'd like to know if they're by the same animator. Yeah, yeah. I, I, myself, my business partner, uh, own the company. This was our first production of the new company that we set up about two and a half years ago. So basically, it's a working week um, of the embalmer. So that one is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So each day he meets a new body and has a conversation. <laughs> But I mean, all the stories are quite sad, but they all are uplifting and happy at the end. But then, without giving it away, but you know, Friday then, he basically um, sits down for a cup of tea and it's his wife sitting opposite him. So then we learn that he has been grieving and he's been projecting his grief on the bodies and he finally gets to speak to his wife on Friday. Um, and it's just him and her having a little last conversation and she sings him a song that she used to sing. And then at the end, he just goes, I miss you something fierce. And I suppose that's the kind of, we realize then he's grieving himself. So with the structure of the film, because we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, initially you had it, they were all five together. Yeah, we cut it. We cut it into a half hour for the film festivals, and we won Rain Dance with the half hour, and we won Rhode Island. But I suppose some of the feedback we were getting was it's better to have a short, short. So we picked the strongest episode then to put into film festivals. And so people can, if people wanted to see it, uh, the whole Monday through Friday. Will we have an opportunity to do that? Yeah, once we're finished all the film festivals, we'll then put it up online and hopefully it, it'll be broadcast on TV in Ireland and hopefully we'll start selling it then to TV stations. Yes, please. Not at all, but if you look at Islamic art history, we've always had figurative uh, um, representation. So this, even historically in manuscripts, 
um, you had uh, you had that present. Um, what what you're uh, describing is uh, present in, the, in Islamic uh, states, and we suffered a bit of that during the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, reign. Uh, there there was uh, this discourse uh, reappearing, um, but that it's not the case now. It's not the case now. Is there a question in the balcony? Does anybody like to ask questions? All right. Any more questions? One more question. Yes. It's if I can repeat, just because people in the balcony, did everybody hear that? Did you hear it in the balcony? Okay, great. So it's um, the blue bra was um, a conscious uh, retaliation for the event that you saw, um, but n not only uh, to bring the voice of the women. We did it um, also as humans. You know, we were not only um, answering to the problems of women, but to all of the injustice that was taking place. And we, all, we had one woman martyr that was uh, being represented in the revolution, so we were not extremely excluded. But most of the figures were uh, men, you are right. But we, we only had one woman, and her role was never um, highlighted. So uh, the, the biggest problem for us was the sexual harassment, because it was targeted, and it was extremely aggressive. And a lot of us also... Um, you saw like one of the artists say, I was scared that I wouldn't go down on the street after that. So to us, we had uh, more issues. Actually, we had one martyr this January. She was shot on the street on the day um, on, of the revolution by the police. So we, we're, still, uh, we're still counting martyrs. It's not over yet. Actually, I do have one final question for you um, for right now, which is... Um, when street artists, whether it was women or men, did you go out together? Did you, was it, was it a solitary activity? Did you go out to protect each other? Yes, it was amazing because in Tahrir, at some point, uh, the men would make like, um, like a fence with their bodies to protect. And they had tunnels, safe tunnels of men, men's bodies where women could walk through in the crowd. So it was very organized. Uh, it was, and then uh, later on, on the 30th of uh, June, we were standing in the, we had a whole area exclusively for women and the men were standing around to protect them. So we had systems in place for uh, protecting women that were actually going down to the street. I want to thank you all for being here. It was, what a great screening and what a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.